Welcome to A Look Ahead. We're delighted that you've decided to join us. You probably know by now that we study the Sabbath School lessons as prepared by the Seventh-day Adventist Church. And this particular series is a great one on the Book of Romans, entitled Salvation by Faith Alone, the Book of Romans. This is lesson number eight in that series, entitled Who is the Man of Romans 7? So you can guess what we're going to be talking about. I hope you have your Bible open to Romans 7. <coughs> if you don't, grab it quick, and let's begin with a word of prayer. Our kind and wonderful Father, as we consider the struggles that Paul talks about, help us to understand how those struggles apply also to us, and how we can be victorious as Paul was, is our prayer in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, in this chapter, if you're familiar with Romans 7, Paul describes a terrible struggle that sinners go through in abandoning the sinful lifestyle and becoming true Christians. Scholars have debated at length about whether it is a description of Paul's experience, his, Paul's own experience, first of all, and then if so, is it a description of him before his conversion, during his conversion, or after his conversion? And we, of course, assume in that that Paul's conversion would be the experience he had on the Damascus Road. So, um, do you think he had any twinges of con con conscience about what he was doing before Damascus Road? Yes, because Jesus said, is it hard to kick against the pricks? In other words, God was trying to get to him even before that point, and he was kicking back against those. So he was. We know that, don't we? Ellen White talks about that considerably in Acts of the Apostles, page 112 and 113. Um, but during that time, those early years, Paul was determined to destroy this heretical group called Christians. Then Paul had what, had what I like to call a fruit basket upset. And what did he do? He suddenly started seeing everything from a different view, and he says, you know, I didn't think about this for a while. He preached in Damascus until they were ready to throw him out. He went to the Arabian Desert for a long period of time, up to three years. Then he came back to Damascus, and boy, his, his arguments were so persuasive at that point that th th no one could stand up to him. So they, they thought, okay, if you can't argue with this guy, what do you do? Kill him! And then what did he do? He escaped. <laughs> they let him down in a basket over the wall of Damascus. If you, if you ever get to Damascus, there's still parts of the old wall there, and you can, you can see places where someone could have been left down from, uh, from a window. Well, so now let's just set the pattern really quick, uh, what we're talking about here. Remember Romans 5, 1, it says, Now that we have, be we have been put right with God through faith, we have peace with God, and we mentioned you may not have peace with anybody else, but you have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. Then if you go on, in Romans 6, we are told that baptism is to represent the burial of our old ideas and ways of living. We're supposed to rise to a new life, but we soon discover that the devil is alive and well, even on this side of baptism, unfortunately. In fact, we are told to live a new life, but those old habits are still there. And the devil is just as determined to keep us from living a Christian life as we might be determined to live a Christian life. So what does Paul say? Well, Paul stated his belief, his belief very clearly in Romans 6, 14. We are not under law, but under grace. Shouldn't that take care of it? it depends what we understand by the word grace again. Yeah. Well, a few verses later, Paul says, sin pays its wage death. That ought to be an adequate warning, shouldn't it? So is it God who kills people that don't line up? Sin. Sin does. Sin. Death is a consequence, not a penalty, not a punishment. I like Richard Neese, what he used to say. God doesn't need to make sin any worse than it, than it already is by threatening yeah. you to do, that he's going to do something to you. Well, what would, how would our lives be different if we really believed that death was the consequence of sin? Ever ask yourself that? Well, right now, death is the consequence of life. 
Well, I mean, we're all heading no. for death. Yeah. Well, come on, you're you're thinking pretty spiritually here, but when you look at everybody else, they're not thinking your way. You're thinking, but but your 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 argument has a serious weakness, and that's it. It didn't apply in the Garden of Eden. Okay, but we weren't talking about the Garden of Eden. Well, we were talking about us now today, looking at the population. That's what I kind of yeah. got the idea okay. of. Laws have to have a universal application. If they don't always apply, then there's something wrong with the law. There are no exceptions to the law of gravity. Even the stars out there apparently obey the law of gravity. Or exceptions to the law of love, then, isn't yeah. it? Exactly. Yeah. Those exactly. Who, are, who are atheists, though, would say, well, I'm going to die. So, yeah. you know, the Epicurean philosophy, you know, we eat, drink, and be merry, for tomorrow we die. So, uh, even though... Well, our, our, and there are people that I'm sure you tell that if you continue to smoke or this or that or the other, you will have these consequences. And they're thinking, yeah, but I knew so-and-so lived to be 90, and he did this, and he got away with it, so I'm, I'm also going to yeah. get away with it. <laughs> yeah, uh -huh, sure, until you get lung cancer or heart attack or something else yeah. like that. And we shouldn't conclude that our sins is what kills us. Sin is what kills, period. It kills all of us. Mm -hmm. <laughs> That's why so many babies who have never sinned also die. It's not our sins only that kill us. It's the sins of the well, world. Satan has claimed, and he would love to prove it, that the wages of sin is not death. In fact, his first lie was, you're not going to die if you do this sin, wasn't it? Right there in the Garden of Eden. So the stakes are very high. The question is, who's, gonna, who's telling the truth? Is God, did God tell us the truth when he said, if you sin, you will die? Or is Satan telling us the truth? No, you, you can sin and not die. And if you look at around, if you, look at, if, you, if you take a very narrow view and you're looking at just the world right around us right now, we're all sinners, are, are any of us dead? Well, not yet. So, you, you know, you might be able to get away with that thinking for a little while. So if Satan's lying, how can he try to prove it right? He hasn't succeeded so far, but he has, he, he's convinced a lot of people that it is right. Yeah, but does he believe it? I don't know. He is so self-deceived that I don't know what he believes anymore. Well, if he's lying, Jesus says he was a liar in a... A He's a murderer the, from the beginning. Exactly. So if you are that way, you're premeditated. Yeah. Satan claims that everyone who dies belongs to him. But by rising from the dead in his own power, Jesus broke open the grave and destroyed Satan's claims. So again, I ask the question, do we believe that sin pays its wage death? Most people don't uh, translate it that uh, which that is a proper way, but most people don't translate it that way. Mm -hmm. They think that the wages of sin is death. Yeah, that's the way, but it's more correctly translated the way you just did it. Yeah. You know, Satan is a trinity. He's the father of evil, he's the son of perdition, and he's the spirit of evil, mm -hmm. all in one person. Well, many think that the process of, of this, this, whatever you want to call it, this conundrum, is justification. He says, I don't know how to do this. There's no way I can live a righteous life. But don't worry. I claim Jesus, and he declares me righteous. So that raises some questions, and we need to be honest. If God can declare us righteous without any change actually taking place in us, how does that relate to the struggle with sin? There shouldn't be any more struggle left, right? If God declares us righteous, shouldn't that take care of everything? And shouldn't that take care of everyone who, so that everyone is saved? If that is true, why does he delay his second coming? Why can't he just declare everybody righteous and then come back? Shouldn't that be the end of it? Why didn't, and of course, if God can do that without us having to do anything on our part, God should have done that with the devil when he first sinned back in the beginning, right? Prevented this whole mess. 
Well, justification and sanctification together produce salvation. Justification is by faith, sanctification is by faith, salvation is by faith. Right? But if we want to be saved or healed, remember the word salvation means to be healed. There, then it is, some ch is some change actually necessary? Do you agree with these words from the Bible study guide? Here's what our Bible study guide says. Bible students differ on whether Romans 7 was Paul's experience before or after his conversion. Whatever position one takes, what's important is that Jesus' righteousness covers us and that in his righteousness we stand perfect before God who promises to sanctify us, to give us victory over sin, and to conform us to the image of his Son. Romans 8, 29. But now, if he's going to give us victory over sin, does that mean, does that mean there's some change in us? These are the crucial points for us to know and experience as we seek to spread the everlasting gospel to every nation and kindred and tongue and people. So. Sounds mystical to me. Here we see a conflict in meta metaphors. If our own behavior does not matter, and Christ's righteousness covers us completely, then we should not be talking about struggling with sin. But the Bible leaves us with this quandary. We are saved by our faith, but we are judged by our works. Now let's just look at that for a moment. You know Acts 16.31. If I can find where my color cursor is right there. They answered, this is Paul and, and Apollos in the, uh, I'm sorry, Paul and Silas in the Philippian prison. And the, jail, you know, the doors were all wide open because of the earthquake. And then Paul said, believe in the Lord Jesus and you will be saved, you and your family. What's the re only requirement of salvation? And that was after the jailer asked, what must I do to be saved? What must I do to be saved? But then we come up with verses like Revelation 20, verses 12 and 13. And I saw the dead, great and small alike, standing before the throne. Books were opened, and then another book was opened, the book of the living. The dead were judged according to what they had done, as recorded in the books. Then the sea gave up its dead. Death and the world of the dead also gave up the dead they held, and all were judged according to what they had done. So, does if we're saved by faith then what does, this, what does this judging have to do with anything? Well, Here again, we have this problem. The faith is what structures what we become. And we do what we become. It's the faith that is the driving force. If we have that faith, that driving force is going to take us away from the problems of the law. We're not even going to desire to do anything that goes against the law because it goes against love that has grown in our heart. So all this... Uh, Complain about the complaint about the fact that we cannot know what love is. That is the struggle we have. We need to define love, and the only one who has ever done that, no philosopher ever has. Jesus has, mm -hmm. and we need to recognize that love is caring for others even more than we care for ourselves, and that we care for ourselves only to the extent that we want to better serve others, not so as to live a longer life or to be saved. Yeah. Sounds like a recipe. Of Jesus. That's what his whole Sounds mission Sounds like a was. recipe. Mm -hmm. it, um, in a way it is. There's a process to learning what love is, and uh, we don't I have time here to discuss that you it. you said, I should make love. We should always want to be positive for our neighbor and those people who are around us. That's another recipe right the essence there. of love. Yes. So it is a recipe. There is. So you follow the recipe we want to get it. the love. No, it's not following the recipe. It's absorbing it so that it's part of what you are, not what you have to do. Part of what you want because that's what you have become, a loving person. And you are what you think. As a yes. man thinks it's so easy, right? So, so Paul... So there is no recipe. It just no. happens. It, it no. happens from learning. Yeah. It happens from learning, but isn't it about the heart that we're talking it's about? It's a l heart, that heart that is, is transformed by what we learn. Brain. By what we learn? Mm -hmm. I don't know about that. Paul, Paul starts, out, starts off by a sort of a confusing illustration. Let's look at it. Certainly you will, this is Romans 7, of course. Certainly you will understand what I'm about to say, my brothers and sisters, because all of you know about law. The law rules over people only as long as they live. 
A married woman, for example, is bound, I don't know why he could have said a married man, but a married woman, for example, is bound by the law to her husband as long as he lives. But if he dies, then she is free from the law that bound her to him. So then, if she lives with another man while her husband is alive, she'll be called an adulteress. But if her husband dies, she is legally a free woman and does not commit adultery if she marries another man. That is how it is with you, my sisters and brothers. As far as the law is concerned, you also have died because you are part of the body of Christ. And now you belong to him who was raised from death in order that we might be useful in the service of God. For when we lived according to our human nature, the sinful desires stirred up by the law were at work in our bodies, and all we did ended in death. Now, however, we are free from the law because we died to that which once held us prisoners. No longer do we serve in the old way of a written law, but in the new way of the Spirit. We're talking about life and death now. Mm -hmm. You live to the, either live to God's way or you live to the so, evil way. So does salvation come by keeping the rules? No. It comes by and studying the life of Christ that shows us what love is to the point where we want that love so much and we become more loving. Mm -hmm. Okay. So once the, husband, <laughs> once the husband is dead, she is free to marry without committing adultery. Okay, we all understand that part. This illustration would fit perfectly if it was the law that died, and of course that's what a lot of our friends want to claim. But Paul makes it very clear that he, not the law, is the one who dies. So now we have, this is confuses the woman, things. The woman dies, not Paul. Yeah, well, but Paul later talks about his dying. Yeah. So what actually happens? If God knows not the woman who dies, it's her husband that dies. Yes. It's isn't, not the woman who dies. Isn't the husband yeah, in this, in the, this metaphor, the dies. doesn't the husband in this metaphor represent the law? Well, because, I mean, because what, you die to the law. That's the question we're asking. Well, okay, it is. We, okay. We like, we okay, here's the problem. We do not have any human illustrations of a woman who dies and then remarries. Well, can't you just turn it around? <laughs> it, th but it's a hypothetical. It's an illustration. It's, not a, it's, it's an it's illustration not. Yeah. because you can turn illustrations around. So what actually happens? If God is the one who kills, then his forgiveness is sufficient. But if sin pays its wage, remember we talked about Romans 6.23, then someone else cannot reap the consequences. Don't you have to, in order to get a wage, don't you have to work for it? No. Well, not necessarily. Why not? Well, that, isn't that what a work? wage is? It's sin is it works just like yeah. righteousness is works. Yeah. Yeah, I know, but <laughs> if, if the wages are sin of death, that means that you're working for it to yeah. get the death. Okay. Well, you're, do, you're doing things, and the end result is death. Yeah, but you're working for it, for your wage. You're work, working, it, working for it by doing it. Okay, here's, here's the way our lesson study describes this. See what you think. Is this, is this adequate? As the death of her husband delivers the woman from the law of her husband, so the death of the old life in the flesh through Jesus Christ delivers the Jews from the type, I'm sorry, from the law they had been expected to keep under the Messiah fulfilled its types. Until the Messiah fulfilled its types. Now the Jews were free to remarry. They were invited to marry the risen Messiah and thus bring forth fruit to God. This illustration was one more device Paul used to convince the Jews that they were now free to abandon the ancient system. Is that what Paul is trying to tell us? Well, they're illustrations. You've got to get the illustration right yeah. in the first place. You can kind of turn them around if you want. Okay, now we're faced with several other challenging questions. Who or what actually died in this illustration? It was her first husband that dies, right? Mm, that That's what the illustration says. Yes. Mm. I thought the illustration was talking about the, the law. Well, that's the question. Does it, he uses an illustration. He says, a woman is married to a man. The first man dies. Then she's free to remarry another man. And, and without that's, being a that's grace. You okay. can measure from, you go from well, law, okay, which but, was okay, dead, but die. you see, you're jumping to the conclusion. And we're asking, is that a legitimate jump? Well, it's an illustration. You can't really analyze it that way. It's an illustration. Yeah, well, what's it teaching us? 
Well, that's that's the point right there. So and so I think Paul, it's because it has some, something to do with the law. Well, Paul later says that he died. What did Paul ask the Jews to abandon? Were they trying to keep the law as a way of being saved? What I mean, what is he saying to these people in Rome? What do you think he's actually trying to say to them? That he, that he died when he says, I died? Don't you die to sin? Yeah. Well, that's maybe what that's what he's talking about. Well, okay, let's hope so. Does life go better when you do things God's way? Or is well, it better to... Well, depends on how you define... Uh, it, well, you know, we, we, uh, we're headed for the cross is if we do things God's way. So we... Uh, things are, but things are not always as they appear to be. You know, mm -hmm. the disciples saw Jesus die on the cross or go to the cross. When you're the in harmony, when you're in harmony with the truth, do things go better than if you're not in harmony with the truth? Well, the devil wants to make sure that you don't things don't go better when you're in harmony with the truth. Yeah, so that things will go bad and you'll curse God and die. That's what he's That's trying to do. That's what he wants. Do. Yeah. Okay, but if you're if you're following the truth, things should go a little better when you Okay, think? but but look at the illustration. Our yeah. Christian friends would like to say, well that first husband that died is the old law. Get rid of it. So now we're going to we're going to live according to the new spirit, the spirit of life in Christ Jesus. We don't need the law anymore. See, I, I think that Paul is trying to say there's no such thing as an absolute law. Mm -hmm. And we all know that. There are plenty of loopholes, and no matter how many laws you make, you're going to always have loopholes and problems. Paul is saying human laws, they're loopholes, they're problems, they're never an absolute. One thing is an absolute, the Spirit of Christ, mm -hmm. which is the love of God. Yeah, but That's an absolute. When you start talking about the law as far as saving you, it if you look at you. the law, if you look at the law and you believe that it's going to save you, mm -hmm. well, no, you're still living towards to the law. But if you die towards the law and live to the grace, that yeah. means you've changed. Yeah. You, you yeah, but look at the way Jesus himself handled, handled, handled the law. When he said, uh, you know, if you call your, your brother Raka, you've already committed murder or you've already sinned against him. It's not the, the letter of the law that's important. It's the spirit of the law. And again, that's, well, it's true, that's true, but I think he was trying to discourage him to also from, from looking okay. so much towards the law for salvation. Because he said, look, you're not doing it, so what's the point? Gonna, it's not going to work. Well, let, let's, let's, let's be honest. Our Christian friends go through this, all these hoops and so forth, and all they really want to get rid of is the Sabbath. Is there any indication in Romans 7 that Paul was trying to get rid of the Sabbath? No. He doesn't even mention it. Or, for so, that matter, anywhere else in Scripture, is there any evidence that Paul or yeah. the Christ or the Apostles were trying to get rid of the Sabbath? Yeah. The Apostle Paul, I'm, I'm now quoting from Ellen White. This is Spirit of Prophecy, Book 4, page 297. The Apostle Paul, in relating his experience, presents an important truth concerning the work to be wrought in conversion. He says, I was alive without the law once. He felt no condemnation. But when the commandment came, when the law of God was urged upon his conscience, sin revived and I died. Then he saw himself a sinner, condemned by the divine law. Mark, it was Paul and not the law that died. Does that, does that make this picture clearer? Well, well that's why I'm saying that it's the woman, you know, in the setup, it says the husband dies, but then in the actual playing out of the, the, the narrative, it's the woman that dies. But how can she remarry if she's dead? But she comes back to life in Christ. Um, it's, it's not a natural, you know, if you're looking for a natural explanation here, I think you're not going <laughs> to find it. <laughs> I think we have a conflict of paradigms here. Yeah, we do. So. Um, as, we, as we're well aware, there's several different ways that people have looked at law. A lot of people want to focus, when they say law, in modern times, a lot of Christians say law, ah, that's talking about the Ten Commandments. But to be honest, we know that to a Jew, the word law, which is Torah in Hebrew, means what? Books of Moses. The five books of Moses. 
And once Jesus said, look at, look at John 10, 34. Jesus answered, it is, it is written in your own law that God said, ye are gods. And where does it say that? Psalms 82. Psalms 82, 6. You are gods, I said. All of you are children of the Most High. And so forth. There it that's, is. Psalms that's Elohim. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Well, so, small g. What's well, Elohim? It's, uh, yeah. Sometimes El it's, a it's a generic large term G, for all well, intelligence. So, so the, so the right. question here in our discussion right. is, what did what did Paul think would be? A, what did, what was he trying to say to the people in Rome? Did he was he talking about the Ten Commandments? Was he talking about the five books of Moses? Was he talking about all law and the entire Old Testament? I think he was talking about all legal systems. There's no such thing as a legal system that can make a human being better. And you get, period. And yeah. we are proving that every day in our own uh, democracy, where the more laws we have, and as we said earlier, the worse we're getting. So the laws are not going to save us. And Only the, the Spirit of Christ will. And then the Ten Commandments is in those books. Mm -hmm. And that's so, a prescription rather than a proscription. Yeah. Well, if you're going to separate law that way by saying somehow the Ten Commandments are, are different, well then how can you do that when the Ten Commandments is being actually in the Torah? Well, you Paul, can't command love. Yeah. Okay? Well, All you can do is... That's not my question. My question is, how, if you're talking about law and you're going to separate law, so we, makes, we, make one, one different than the other, how are you going to do it? We have to remember how laws came about to begin with, mm -hmm. because in Exodus 19, it's very clear that God said, if you listen to me, you're going to be okay. Oh, but we don't want to listen to you. We want laws. Why? Because that was the way the world was being governed in those days. Amurabi had already been around and all the rest. Mm -hmm. So God, out of his kindness, says, if you had listened to me, this is what you would do. And he gives them those Ten Commandments. Beautiful. A perfect way to say, if you guys were loving, here's how you would act. Mm -hmm. <laughs> well, Paul goes on. Now he's going to take on another illustration of sorts. Shall we say then that the law itself is sinful? Of course not, he says. But it was the law that made me know what sin is. If the law had not said, do not desire what belongs to someone else, I would not have known such a desire. Now, I have some questions about that. I have, in our family, in my sort of enlarged family, I have a number of fairly, fairly young children. And they don't, it doesn't take them very long to figure out, I want that. You can't have it. It's mine. But anyway, so Paul says, that's the problem. I discovered that this was I was sinning because the law told me you can't covet. So, let's think about that. Can law die? Well, you can change laws. You can, you can change it, yeah. Delete them and put in. How vote do you them teach? Out and then vote some others in. Yeah. How do you teach children to to obey? Best by example. Mm -hmm. How do you, how do children learn to brush their teeth? Do they learn to brush their teeth because you threaten them every time it's time to brush their teeth that you're going to beat the blank of the blank out of them if they don't brush their teeth? Or how do you teach them? Blankety blank. <laughs> <laughs> whatever you want. Whatever you want to put in there. Might work, but that's not the ideal. Okay. Might work for a few days. It might work for a few days. Well, Until I they leave it. home. Oh. It might work if they if they seeing you do it, yeah. or uh, if they ultimately see value in doing yeah. it. Yeah. Well, as as Fred has pointed out many times, the moral law. If we if we and, and when he talks about covetousness, we know he's referring to the tenth commandment, right? So clearly he's he's talking about at least that. So now, these, this Ten Commandment Law, we, we sometimes call it the moral law, is a direct reflection of God's character and is summed up by the two great commandments that Jesus himself talked about, Matthew 22, Mark 12, Luke 10, you know, love to God and love for your fellow man. 
It is based on eternal principles that will never change. But the books of Moses describe a great number of other laws and rules and, and, and statutes that no longer applied to people after, their, after the life, death, and resurrection of Jesus. So is that what Paul was talking about? Why, why do you think Paul came up with talking about the Tenth Commandment all of a sudden in this, this, in this chapter? In his, it's something that is uh, appreciable to the carnal mind. In other words, okay. with, apart from Christ, we have this standard. We can see it. We can understand it. We might even say it's good. Or, you know, if somebody like uh, goes to a mission field and lays down their life and, and gives up uh, their life for that, we might approve of that and say that's a really good thing, but we may not do it ourselves. Yeah. Is it hard to control our thinking? I mean, if you... I don't ever Do you have to ask that question? <laughs> <laughs> what is the most so. deceitful? <laughs> I mean, we could the heart hide of a man lot of things that we're thinking. Most deceitful. And we'll look, look pretty, okay. pretty so, biased. So that's exactly what I want to talk about next. I one time spent quite a bit of time looking through the books of Moses to see what it says about each one of the Ten Commandments. And what you learn is there's a death decree associated with every single commandment except the tenth. Why is that? Because you cannot tell what I am thinking, whether I am covetous or not. You don't dare covet. How do but you But know? I can't tell it. <laughs> That's right. Or you how can you prove it in court? Yeah. You, you can't prove that somebody's coveting. You may see their behavior and know that they're coveting, but you can't prove it. Now, Jesus told people that even if you're thinking about something towards a woman, that you're committing adultery. Yeah, and that's the expansion of that idea is Matthew 5 to 7, where it talks about all the ways in which you can, even if you, even if you hate someone or if you say bad things to them, it means... Covet your neighbor, neighbor's wife. Yeah, you know, that would mm -hmm. be... It's not the letter of the law, it's the spirit of the law. Mm -hmm. yeah. Well, before his experience on the Damascus Road, Paul had believed that he was doing well in the eyes of God. I'm sure that if Paul had been there when that rich young ruler walked up to Jesus and said, What lack I yet? And, and Jesus said, Well, you go and keep the law. And, Paul, and the young, what, did the, what did the rich young ruler say? All these things I have done for my youth up. And I'm sure that Paul would have said exactly the same thing if he had been asked at that point in time. Well, he yeah. kind of says the same thing in... Philippians sure. 3. Yeah. Yeah. Of course, Paul didn't want to ask, didn't need to ask what one more thing must I do for eternal life. He knew he had it. Yeah, exactly. But when Paul looked at the Tenth Commandment, he recognized that it was a commandment that forbade even thinking wrong thoughts. It made him angry. He was willing to do what he believed God required him to do. But he thought it was an intrusion into his privacy for God to tell him what he was allowed to think. Exactly. But after considering the issues as a Christian, Paul came to a very different conclusion. He recognized that in virtually every case, we as humans, um, we as human beings, break the Tenth Commandment before we break any of the others. Thus, if God wants to create a perfect society, in heaven and invite some of us to live there, he can only take people to heaven who do not even want to sin. Thus the Tenth Commandment specifically becomes a guarantee of future safety in the heavenly kingdom and in the earth made new. Not even want to sin? You can't even want to sin. You, do that, you, if you think about sin, do you want to sin? Well, not necessarily. It's interesting to say that Ellen White says in one spot, she says, if Satan could go to heaven, it would be pure torture for him. Because you have to be loving. Well, he, he wouldn't be comfortable around <laughs> he loving people. Not be comfortable at all. Which is the principle of life he rejected, yeah. none other. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Well, before, before Paul's Damascus Road experience, he was... Well, he, he was quite comfortable with his external behavior. He could read those other nine commandments and feel quite smug. 
So what should be our attitude toward that whole issue? Well, Paul describes back in Galatians that we talked about last quarter, one of the roles of the law. Remember Galatians 3.24, he said that the law is our babysitter. Our babysitter. <laughs> it, I mean, that's really almost what it is. Law is our babysitter to protect us until we learn to do right because it is right. Our Bible study guide goes on to considerable length in pointing out an important principle. The law is necessary because it points out sin. Without it, we would not know what sin is. But the law was never intended to be a cure for sin. It is not a means of salvation. Thus, the law performs an important and essential function, but it cannot do, it, it can do nothing for our salvation. You don't go to the doctor looking for treatment for your disease until you recognize that you're sick. So the law helps us to recognize that spiritually we're sick. It's the diagnosis of our lack of love. Yeah. Romans 7, 12, Paul concludes by saying that the law itself is holy and the commandment is holy, right, and good. So it's doing a good job of pointing out sin, right? Then he says some things. Look at Romans 7, 13 to 15. But does this mean that what is good caused my death? By no means. And he's used quite a bit of the me again oita. No, 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 Paul says repeatedly. It was sin that did it by using what is good. Sin brought death to me in order that this true nature of sin might be revealed. And so by means of the commandment, sin is shown to be even more terribly sinful. We know that the law is spiritual, but I am, hold on. Um, In verse 14. I'm sorry, I pushed. We know that the law is spiritual, but I am unspiritual, sold as a slave to sin. I do not understand what I do, for I don't do what I would like to do, but instead I do what I hate. Since what I do is what I don't want to do, this shows that I agree that the law is right. Um, I, I think of this very often because sitting next to our kitchen sink at home is a gift that someone gave us, a set of very great, wonderful knives. And they are very sharp. And when we first got them, my wife was in the habit of cutting her finger. It seems like every day or two she was, <laughs> she was cutting her finger one way or another. And she's a wonderful person. I, I appreciate her a great deal. But she wasn't used to knives that were so sharp. I mean, they're wonderful <coughs> cu for cutting the things you need to cut. Now, those knives have become a little less dull. I mean, a little less sharp now. They're not quite so sharp after a lot of use. So they're not quite so dangerous. But is the problem with the knife or is the problem with the way you're using it? So I think that's an illustration of the law. The law does it what it's supposed to do, but if you misuse it, mm -hmm. it'll, it'll, it'll bite you. So how is it that sin uses law to bring about our death? Evil is using something good to bring, out something, bring about something evil. Is law at fault? No. Or it's sin that's the, that's the problem. So Paul goes on. Look at, look at verses 14 to 20. <coughs> we, we know that the law is spiritual, but I'm un, un, uh, I am unspiritual, sold as a slave to sin. I do not understand what I do, for I don't do what I li would like to do, but instead I do what I hate. Since what I do is right, I don't want to do, uh, this shows that I agree that the law is right. So I'm not really the one who is, does this thing, rather it is the sin that lives in me. I know that good does not live in me, that is my human nature. For even though the desire to do good is in me, I'm not able to do it. I don't do the good I want to do, instead I do the evil that I do not want to do. If I do what I don't want to do, this means that I'm no longer the one who does it, instead it is the sin that lives in me. So Paul has a whole great controversy going inside of himself, right? So that was happening to him then, right when he wrote that? Sounds like it, doesn't it? It does. No. Well, he's, he's acquainted with that struggle, but I think he's, he's, he's talking about uh, somebody himself 
uh, he says that it dwells in me, nothing good dwells in me that is in my flesh. In other words, me is, is me apart from Christ, mm-hmm. just what I am by nature. Well, he does you agree with the law, though, right? But you he just can't Paul, keep it. You don't think Satan was after Paul even when he was a Christian? Well, sure. Yeah. Sure. So he, he, he said he died daily. He said, I buffet mm-hmm. my, uh, myself and keep uh, under subjection, mm-hmm. myself under subjection. So he was well aware of those struggles. But if you follow the narrative, it's obvious that he's, he's uh, in a safe relationship because he knows the answer. He knows where he's headed with this. So now in the last, in these two chapters of Romans, yes. Jeremiah 17, excuse me, 17, 9. The heart is deceitful above all things and desperately corrupt. Who can understand it? Yeah. Well, in Romans 6 and 7, we have now seen two illustrations from human life of what it means to live lives under, the, under grace. One, like a new baby in the truth, having put to death the old man of sin. And two, like a woman who is bound to her husband so long as he's alive, but when he dies, she is free to marry another. So Paul pointed out the truth that he must have learned in his days as a Pharisee, trying to earn salvation by keeping the law never works. The law just keeps on pointing out our sins and failures. So Paul told us that we must give up on that old way of trying to prove that we can live righteous lives in our own strength under the law, and instead accept God's way of righteousness, which is to focus on the life of Christ until by beholding we become changed. Then Paul admitted that when we do this, Satan and his evil angels come out against us in full force. Now, I have another question for you. If we are actually getting very near the end of this world's history, do you think Satan is more in earnest, to the, that his angels are more in earnest, or they're they're slacking off. More in earnest. More in earnest. I mean, to Satan, this is a life and death issue. Yes. Because the longer he can keep us going on in sin, the longer he can live. But once, if, if a group of us come together and, and really accept God's way and really want to be like him and really focus on becoming like him and, and set enforce the devil to, to stand behind us, then he's finished. It's the end for him. I, I don't know if it's really life or death. I think it's, it's winning or losing. It says the devil all the same and tremble. Hmm? The Bible says the devils believe and tremble. Mm-hmm. They know what's coming down. Well, see, Hebrews 2, it says that uh, the fear of death are subject to lifelong bondage. How about mm-hmm. Satan? He's been around a lot longer, mm-hmm. and his he's fear is dying. And I don't know about that. Some Christians hide behind Paul's description in Romans 7. They are having trouble with the struggle to live a good life. So they abandon that struggle and say, it doesn't matter anyway, because Christ can take care of it all. Is that what Paul intended? Not if you keep reading into <laughs> chapter 8. <laughs> yeah. Paul seemed to have been trying to divide up the body and the mind. Can you do that? For well, an you illustration. Can, you can describe different parts in the same way you could describe an automobile by referring to the engine and the drivetrain and the transmission. Mm-hmm. All of these have functioning parts, but in and of themselves, they would, wouldn't be, have as much use. They wouldn't be a car. So being honest now, someone like you who has a pretty good idea about human physiology, where is all this taking place? Is it happening in the finger, and the toe, and the tummy, or? Well, the battleground is the mind, but yeah, sure. uh, the mind receives hormones from different places, and, uh, and there the, uh, there's the idea of now coming out that uh, if we feed our bad bacteria in our gut, they send out messages to the brain to send more sugar. And oh. oh boy, we're talking about real evils now, aren't we? Yeah. <laughs> So, yeah, I mean, you can't, can't divide the two, but they, they coexist and interact. Well, as I said earlier, sometimes we, we say, well, there, there's an evil angel standing on this side, and there's a good angel standing on, I don't know, which, maybe they trade sides once in a while, I don't know. Is that really true? 
do we have evil angels trying to influence us all the time? And good angels trying to influence us all the time? I think so. I think yes. so. It's got to be. I, I, I'm, sh I'm sure that if I were one of, devil's, one of the devil's angels, I would be working my tail off to keep people from stopping sinning. I don't know. Well, if the angels could do that, why is it that they're not more successful in keeping me on the right track? <laughs> Are you talking about the good angel? The good now? angel, yeah. I mean, they ought to be more powerful than the, the wicked ones, right? Because they're not forcing you. <laughs> exactly. Yeah, That's the whole true. point. Yeah. Jack Provence used the illustration of, of a kind of a balance beam. God equalizes so that you can have free will. He doesn't overpower you. Never does so that the good angels don't overpower you. Do we understand how these things really work in our brain? We, I, all of us here, I'm sure, would agree that the great, the great controversy happens right in here for all of us. It's not a struggle between two different kind of angels. It's a struggle between truth yeah. and error. Yeah. <laughs> That's all it is. Yeah. Uh, well, and, and these angels, the, we, we, we talk about the angels because these are the tools they use. The, the truth in the air, but what are, I mean, think about it for just a moment. What tools does Satan use? Lying, deceit, force if he can. Uh, he'll use any of that kind of stuff. He will use any, he, he has no qualms about using any kind of deceitful method he can possibly get away with. Okay, on the other side, what does God use? Truth and love. Now, superficially, if you look at that, that sounds like there's no way that could be a fair fight. I mean, all these things that Satan uses and over here, there's truth and love. And you might think that God is going to lose this great controversy, but he's not. Well, Paul comes to the end of his discussion on this controversy, and what did he say? Oh, wretched man that I am, who shall deliver me from the body of this death? Romans 7.24. It's interesting the word wretched there that Paul used to describe himself is this, in this verse is taliparos, which is used in only one other place in the New Testament. You know where it's used? In Revelation 3 to describe Laodiceans. Who are the Laodiceans in, in Christian history? Us. The saddest right now. In what sense could Laodiceans be wretched? Aren't we the faithful, tithe-paying, health-reforming, Sabbath-keeping saints in the church? Well, we think we're rich and increased in goods and in need of nothing. Mm. So how could we? Re how could we be wretched? I'm because we're wretched, and neck and naked, and <laughs> blind. Could all of our efforts be spiritually, wasted? Spiritually empty. We're we by nature wretched, mm -hmm. like that. Hold God, the form of godliness, but deny the power thereof. God said that the Laodiceans make him nauseated. That's what the word means. Nauseated enough to vomit. And there are several reasons for that. One of which, we're not buying the gold, which means we're not interested in the truth. Mm -hmm. And of course, we're not wi willing to change clothing, which is not clothing, but mm -hmm. changing the way, wh what we are as opposed to what we do, mm -hmm. because everything is about what we are, not about what we do. Mm -hmm. Ellen White has a couple of interesting statements in places that we normally don't, aren't familiar with. Christ declares that pretentious piety is nauseating to him. So could, could, could anybody in Laodicea, Laodicea be described as pretentiously pious? To the one so full of self-sufficiency, he says, I know thy works, that thou art neither cold nor hot. Their works are opposed to the holy principles of God's word. Ellen White, Special Testimony Series B, that might be a place you haven't thought of before. Number two, page 20, very first paragraph. And then another spot, a lifeless profession is nauseating to God. Christ cannot present before the Father those who are lukewarm. She then quotes Revelation 3, 16 and 17. General Conference Bulletin, April 6, 1903. Well, lukewarm is a, is a metaphor for something. What is it? Luke what? what? Lukewarm. Oh, lukewarm. Not well, hot or cold. Yeah. 
Okay, but what the, why does that make God vomit? Wishy-washy. Have, have, you, have you tried to eat, drink lukewarm water? Well, if, it's, if it tastes good, I'm okay with it. If it tastes bad, I need it cold. The sugar in the do do we not sometimes feel that we are worn out from hard work one of the meanings of the word wretched in Greek is that the result of trying to earn our own salvation by keeping the law of paying tithe etc as Seventh-day Adventists we are known as by many of our Christian friends as being a legalist because we insist on obeying all the command all the commandments including the Sabbath commandment why aren't we known for our picture of God and our understanding of the great controversy? I'm not too sure of it. <laughs> Very few of us understand what it's all about. Well, here's another place, Ellen White, Ministry of Healing, 452. The life of the Apostle Paul was a constant conflict with self. He, that is Paul, said, I die daily, 1 Corinthians 15:31. His will and his desires every day conflicted with the duty and the will of God. Instead of following inclination, he did God's will, however crucifying to his nature. Is that a struggle? Sounds like a struggle, doesn't it? Well, it was for Jesus, too, uh, when it came to the time, time to go to the cross. Nevertheless, not my will, but thy will be done. So what kind of things do we struggle with? Here's a real, I don't know what to call it, you know the challenge saying? thinking, the drunkard is despised and told that his sin will exclude him from heaven, while pride, selfishness, and covetousness too often go unrebuked. But these are sins that are especially offensive to God, for they are a contrary to the benevolence of his character to that unselfish love which is the very atmosphere of the, fallen of the unfallen universe. He who falls into some of the grosser sins, like drunkenness, may feel a sense of his shame and poverty and his need of the grace of Christ, but pride feels no need, and so it closes the heart against Christ and the infinite blessings he came to give. And that's right in that beautiful little book, Steps to Christ, page 30, first paragraph. Well, do we still have a way to go in our struggle against pride, against, our struggle against pride selfishness, and covetousness? covetousness? Mm -hmm. Well, it's a constant battle, you know. If, we're, I if we think we get to the point where we don't have to battle anymore, then, then we're really in trouble. Yes. Uh, Paul seemed to th feel like he needed to die daily and to uh, buffet his body and keep it under subjection. Jesus had presented the cup of blessing to those who felt that they were rich and increased with goods, Revelation 3.17, and had need of nothing, and they had turned with scorn from the gracious gift. He who feels whole, that is, thinks of all, think of all the bad things he doesn't do, for example, I mean, that is, the man who feels reasonably whole, who thinks that he is reasonably good and is contented with his condition, does not seek to become a partaker of the grace and righteousness of Christ. Pride feels no need, and so it closes the heart against Christ and the infinite blessings he came to give. There is no room for Jesus in the heart of such a person. Mount of Blessing, page 7, first paragraph. Wow. So if we are serious about being Christians, then we still have work to do. God can only admit to heaven people who really want to be loving and kind all the time. So she says, Ellen White says, this is Signs of the Times, December 28, 1891, your energies are required to cooperate with God. Without this, if it were possible, the force upon you with a hundredfold greater intensity, the influences of the Spirit of God, it would not make you a Christian a fit subject for heaven. So, I mean, why doesn't God do that? Doesn't work, right? The stronghold of Satan would not be broken. There must be the willing and the doing of the, on the part of the receiver. There must be an action representing as coming out from the world and being separated. There must be a doing of the words of Christ. So, and there's lots of passages where she said God will not use force. 
God will never try to force us to do his will. Salvation means healing. If we refuse God's medicine, there's nothing more that he can do for us. Some of you, several of us are in the healthcare field. Can we force someone to be well? Nope. Not really. You can't force, educate somebody to want to do what's right either. You can only lead them there. And mm -hmm. The effort to earn one, and this is Ellen White's words again, the effort to earn one's salvation by one's own works inevitably leads men to pile up human exactions as a barrier against sin. For seeing that they fail to keep the law, they will devise rules and regulations of their own to force themselves to obey. All this turns the mind away from God to self. His love dies out of the heart, and with it perishes love for his fellow men. A system of human invention, with its multitudinous exactions, will lead its advocates to judge all who come short of the prescribed human standard, the atmosphere, uh, you know, to judge all who come short of its human prescri prescribed human standard. The atmosphere of selfish and narrow criticism stifles the noble and generous emotions and causes men to become self-centered judges and petty spies. Mount of Blessing, page 123. So what about us? By studying the character of Christ revealed in the Bible, by practicing his virtues, the believer will be changed into the same likeness of goodness and mercy. Christ's work of self-denial and sacrifice brought into the daily life will develop the faith that works by love and purifies the soul. There are many who wish to evade the cross-bearing part, but the Lord speaks to all when he says, if any man will come after me, let him deny himself, take up his cross, and follow me. Counsels to Teachers 249. Well, do you agree with Paul's conclusions? Do you, do you, have we learned something from all this discussion today? Um, Paul certainly didn't hold the illusion that there were no, nothing to be done to, for a person to be Christian. Um, it's, it's a struggle. Do we understand these issues clearly? As we, are we ready to fight the good fight of faith? Remember some of Paul's final words? In the light of the great controversy of God's character and government, will you be there? Our kind and loving Father, as we turn our thoughts to you once again, we thank you for guiding us in this discussion. We thank you for the fact that we have differences of opinion that, that make us think and make us challenge us to have different ideas. Be with those who watch and listen from faraway places that they may benefit from learning to be more like you is our prayer in Jesus' name. Amen.